Hey, what's up, party people? Welcome to an extra long, girthy episode of Honest Trailer Commentaries. I'm here with Lon. I'm here with Danielle. Uh, I've got someone picking up some Craigslist furniture around noon, so that's my hard out. But otherwise, we are here to watch the Snyder Cut Honest Trailer together to give mm. you our behind-the-scenes thoughts, to give you a little more detail tell into what we were thinking what we're uh, discussing uh in the writer's room <laughs> we're gonna watch some deleted scenes we are going to what else do we have we have deleted scenes we got questions and comments from viewers like yourselves and then we've got a clue for next week's honest trailer should you forgive us in your heart and come yeah. back to watch another it, episode it, it feels wrong to have deleted scenes on the snyder cut honest trailer we should have <laughs> just grafted them onto the honest trailer as part of the that's experience. an excellent point yes um so yeah, I mean, if you want to watch us experience it in the for the first time, watch our uh, go on Phantom Entertainment and watch our our watch party that we had for this thing. But obviously, we all went back and privately entered our bat caves, <laughs> hit play, and rewatched it several times on our on our lonesome. So, how did you guys mm. feel about the your your second and beyond viewings uh, in a more calm setting without as much Mountain Dew of the Snyder Cut? How did you guys feel after that? Um, you know, I still, uh, when I, when we watched it with the Mountain Dew, I said that, you know, it's definitely a better movie. It makes it a much better movie for me, but it isn't the movie for me. And I think watching it again, um, without distractions and, and just like fully engaging in the movie again, very, very good. There are great parts to it. Things that I enjoyed. I liked it better than the other one, but it's just, it's not like great. It's good. It's a good movie, but at four hours, I will never do it again. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think the 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 ideal version of the Justice League movie would be one that we'll never get to see. And I, this is not a challenge or a dare. I'm saying we were never going to get to see it. <laughs> not that I want to or we should. But it would be if you did not take the movie or the, the movie did not leave the hands of Zack Snyder and go into the separate hands of Joss Whedon. And if instead we took this cut and we we whittled it down into a releasable two and a half hour, two hour and 40 minute maybe movie. And I think there is, this feels like the, the clay and we need to keep cutting it down more to get to the statue. It's like on its way, but it's not there yet. And I think that it, it, it's not, in its current form, it's like, I'm glad that it's out and it's exhaustive and we get to see everything that he was planning. But I think there's a, probably a pretty good two and a half hour movie in here that we're just like, it's, it's stuck in the middle of a lot of stuff we really probably don't need to see. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think um, I'm probably just gonna echo what both of you said is like, I'm super happy to see this movie and super happy that it exists because this is definitely the undiluted vision of one man. Um, yeah. And this is it, it, like that. That said, like I just think that the the approach he has to um, the DC characters and to and to filmmaking, like it's amazing visually. I just still I can't connect with them with looking at the DC pantheon as unapproachable gods as like these as the titans like literally fighting next to the titans of Mount Olympus. Like there was Zeus. There was uh, Ares and there was a Green Lantern, like they're literal gods. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because like uh, uh, you start off life uh, at a person around our age uh, with like the Joel Schumacher Batmans or like, you know, DC in that era was like patently silly and has been for so long that to, to, to see his such reverential take on these characters and uh, four hours of it is just like, it's a little bit silly to me but i'm super glad that he got to do it um i'm super glad that he got to actually uh, uh leave his mark on this franchise and say like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna throw everything at the screen uh, like i think he thinks in, in visuals first <laughs> i have a hunch that he thinks like how cool would it look if superman was fighting the rest of the justice league how cool would it look to see uh, uh, you know, do uh, dark side, uh, uh, you know, in his element and stuff like that. And then kind of works backwards from there. And man, the visuals are awesome. They, they really are like, like frescoes of like an ancient Greek temple and stuff like that. But I don't know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate with me uh, uh, on like an emotional level. Uh, it, it seems like there's such a distance between you. It's like, there's the gods up here. And then you, the little people down here, were just ants scurrying around. You're either a, a god or a, or a bug man riding around for Steppenwolf. 
And I just find it hard to connect with that for four hours. But I'm still glad, like I said, I'm still glad that he got to do it and that this uh, this film exists. I feel like uh, there is a, and this runs through all of his DC, like the full Snyder verse of DC films. There, there. It seems like he's kind of counting on, you know Superman, you love Superman, you know Wonder Woman, you care about her innately because of who she is. It's a costume, it's an icon, it's powers, it's beyond. And so we don't need to emotionally connect with them. They're just these icons. And, and it's not that we don't emotionally connect, like some characters he obviously does want you to emotionally mm -hmm. connect with in these movies, like Lois Lane, Cyborg, Cyborg. in this one. Uh, so it's not, it's not like I'm trying to say this is a knock on him as a filmmaker. Like I think Dawn of the Dead's another good example. Like he can invest in a character. It's just often he kind of doesn't want to. And in this movie, it really feels like he doesn't want to engage with Bruce Wayne as a man. Bruce Wayne is here to be a symbol and will engage with Alfred as a man who like, he's our mortal version of it. It's kind of like what you were saying about their gods. And I don't know, I just, I, that, that just never works for me. I always want to get to know the heroes as people with personalities and quirks who grow. Like nobody arcs in this movie except for like Cyborg. Cyborg, yeah. And I guess the Flash, now, I'm, I'm sure, like, I'm sure, the Flash I'm sure people believes will. in himself or something, you know, like it's there, but. Now there's, this is all on a spectrum because I think that um, obviously Marvel movies t uh, do this, but they try sometimes too hard to make them like, Spider-Man, he's just like us. Where like every character, no matter what dire situation they're going through is always kind of, you know, hey, we're just buddies, right? Oh, there goes the planet. Whoops. Oh, that's awkward. Right. Like they, they can obviously take the Whedonese, the, the Joss Whedon of it all, way too far. Um, I just think when you and combine- I mean, that's kind of the fundamental Marvel versus DC. Like if you were talking an incredible shorthand about, well, what's the difference between the Marvel and the DC universe is like, this is it. DC is like these, you know, like stop evildoer. Like it's that classic kind of notion of a superhero. And then Marvel was the reaction to that, which is like, what if the superhero was just like the nerdy kid in your class? Like, <laughs> and like, I, this is not, you know, always true or a law or one to one. Like there are plenty of relatable DC characters and plenty of Marvel like stop kind of characters. But that's the, the the fundamental divide, and I think it's particularly stark when you're talking about Joss Whedon's approach to something like the Avengers and then Zack Snyder's approach to something like Justice League. Yeah, uh, Danielle, any further thoughts before we dive right in? Nah, I know I'll have some as it's going through. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk plenty more as it's going. Um, uh, and yeah, I think we'll just ramble on for uh, for hours as we could, as as you should for a movie like the Snyder Cut. I'll so. tell you one thing that repeatedly while I was watching it for the second and then ultimately, yes, folks, third time was uh, Jeremy Irons. I would just like because he was there, like he's on set, like bringing tea in the background to like all the team up scenes where they're all at the back cave making their plans and like. Oh, to be sitting next to Jeremy Irons on set, just like getting his moment to moment thoughts about this film and the story and the other before. Like, I'm sure that was amazing. I would love to hear just his own commentary about what he's experienced. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I can't wait for, uh, was there a making of doc that they came out yes, with at I the think same time? When this or went no? up are on we, HBO are we still waiting Max? for that? No, I think when this went up on HBO Max, they also put up some kind of behind the scenes making up thing, right? I haven't watched it. I still haven't watched that. I, I, that, I, yeah. I should, I should tag that on. Anyways, well, uh, let's start watching the actual honest trailer. I want to be Zack Snyder, Snyder demonstrating how to crack a neck to every actor individually. <laughs> Hit that like eight times. At least ninety degrees. Yeah. From the director of the Justice League, trailer comes the film that rose from the ashes to redeem that burnt orange tire fire, transforming it from a movie that was two hours long and terrible to a movie that's four hours long and mediocre, proving once and for all if you want to look great by comparison. Just stand next to Joss Whedon. The Snyder Cut, for real this time. So pause. I mean, it's impossible to separate how you feel about this movie. Like, I wish I could have, like you said, Lon, just seen this one, like in a vacuum. This was the only version of this film I saw. Because like, 
you just have to, you see so many things and you're like, well, that's better. And that makes right. more sense. Um, but that's such a low bar. That's such a it low is. bar to, to step over. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I, there's there's two things going on there, which is one, I don't envy the task that Joss Whedon was handed. Like this movie, and then you're given it and say, okay, it needs to tell this exact same story. You can't really shoot that much that's new, a little bit here and there, but it has to be two hours, super funny and colorful. Like. <laughs> ha, what? No, it's not possible. So, so there was that, which was he was handed a very difficult task. But then there's the other half, which is every decision he made for the most part is bananas and wrong. And like one prime example that you could visually see right there that I thought that Kevin did, or yeah, I think it's Kevin, uh, whoever did that 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 wipe uh, across. Uh, why would he decide to make the entire finale orange? Like it's such a, <laughs> when you see it look normal in this and it's cool, it makes it extremely bizarre that that would like, I get that they probably said they wanted it to look more colorful for a trailer, but like that's a bananas to see. Like, what are you doing? It looks horrible. Danielle White orange. Like CG <laughs> like worm tentacle root things coming out of the ground. It's like, it's crazy to go back and watch what Whedon did with that scene versus the original one. Like, it makes no sense. Well, and especially because the way that all of this was framed kind of at the time, there's a lot of stuff that obviously like we all did not know. So it felt for a lot of people like, okay, this is going to come in and this is going to make this into the franchise that I wanted it to be. Like, I want to see my heroes look a certain way. Um, and so to have that kind of expectation of like, oh yeah, it's going to be great. Joss is going to do, it's going to be amazing. And then you get in and it was, you know, the kind of Frankensteining that they did together. I can't think of anything that had more in like where the enthusiasm was just popped almost immediately because it starts with that weird mouth scene. Oh, um, <laughs> so just like immediately going from being super hyped because you're a fan of, of these characters and you're a fan of this new director and then just having your hopes dashed and then still having to be in the theater for another two hours. He also, at the, at the opening of the weed version, so first you get the bizarre, like, oh, the people. The baby the, mouth, yeah, yeah. the baby mouth thing. And then you get that scene of Batman and Mindhunter actor, I'm forgetting, Holt McNeary, and he's, like, using this random guy as bait to lure one of the bug the demon pair demons, guys. Uh, yeah. So the Yeah. And then it shows, like, boxes on the wall. That, and I guess he's trying to condense, but it's just, like, that scene made no, it's so bizarre. And you could tell it was reshoots. And then you see it here and it's just like, what? There's so much stuff that they already shot explaining parademons and mother boxes. Like, why would you shoot this new dumb scene? It's just- oh, You have five it's... solid minutes of Superman screaming as he dies. Yeah, <laughs> You're gonna wait for that. <laughs> right. Like, I, yeah, like it, it's, it's always stuff like, well, I get you couldn't just do what this was because it's a four hour juggernaut of storytelling, but I don't get why it turned into what it turned into. Yeah. All right, keep going. Prepare for a film that wouldn't exist without a powerful league uniting behind it, joining the internet's most devoted fans of targeted harassment, creatively bankrupt WB execs, a parent company who would happily piss on the ashes at the last movie theater to sell more broadband, the writer who sharded out Rise of Skywalker, and a director who was already self-indulgent before he formatted a film for IMAX, knowing it would be released on a streaming service. I think he just liked how the bars added more darkness to every scene, right? That's free darkness right there, baby. All right, pause. I mean, it was an amazing just confluence of events. It was it was a convergence of the spheres uh, uh, for this movie to happen. I think that if, if any one of those things doesn't come together, um, I don't think we get to see it. Right, like the pandemic, like causing HBO Max to launch without anything that they could really film, and they have this uh, AT and T being like, "Screw it, we just need signups." Um, uh, and the fans, I mean, the Snyder Cut, Bravo! You know, you guys, you just wanted no, it more. I'm not. I, I'm <laughs> not included in the clapping. That that's not that that, that clapping is Spencer exclusive. No, you well, you know no what they say is a. Uh, after after a sports game, it's like the other the other side just wanted it more. They they had more hustle. <laughs> they, had, they really the, the good uh, game. Good game. That's good true. Game. They definitely good wanted game. it. 
Uh, but it's just, it's, it's just, it's just going to keep going. At some point, these people are going to realize, like, this is not going to fill the void in your life. Like, you're well, gonna no have movie to... can. No, no movie. nothing, nothing can. You're just going to have to, you're just going to have to go on Zoloft like the rest of us folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> no Gal Gadot uh, deleted scenes are going to do it for you. Uh, yeah, I just think it's, um, it, we're living in just a very rare and unique timeline in the multiverse yes. where, uh, where all these things kind of, uh, happened. Uh, right. I mean, even, I do even think... if one, there's a, there's probably a normal, uh, uh, there's universes where we get different versions of the Snyder cut, or he ma just keeps making the movie originally, but to what? get the four hour long one on a streaming service is just like, that's, yeah, that's we, thanks we to also... like some pangolin in China. Like we some also bat. have to... <laughs> like, I think you also have to look at like what an odd situation like DC Warner Brothers has always been. Like usually there's the 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 comp the comic book or the publisher, or the owner of the IP, and it's sort of separate from the studio, and you get this like extended relationship, partnership, negotiation, like Disney and Marvel. Uh and that doesn't happen. Like, like Warner Brothers just owns it. And Warner Brothers executives get to like make up their mind what to do with DC. And then they all get fired and a new group comes in and they get to make up their mind about what to do with DC. And a lot of times it's like totally different from what the guys or the girl of what everybody five or 10 years ago thought. And so you always get this cycle of reinvention that's very unique in terms of like how these stories get told. And so you're always kind of in a situation where this could happen. Like, well, the last regime was going this way and we're gonna come in and go completely the other way, you know? And it's like always these fascinating sort of reversals where you go from like the Schumacher movies to the Nolan movies, you know? Like, and I, I think that's really fascinating to look at if you're looking at the history of DC adaptations as opposed to Marvel where there's you know more like people steering the ship who try to keep a relatively consistent vision yeah and this was just again like a, a historical accident I think where because I I don't think there was like a real stable executive core and a real vision at the helm they were like Zach for these for Man of Steel and for Batman vs Superman do your thing like we we are giving like a filmmaker carte blanche to like do his interpretation of of dc there was no right. feige giving him no. uh notes like oh we actually have to like make it work with all this other stuff like he really got to do you know the the objectivist uh, uh hunky <laughs> hunky the hunky objectivist version yeah. of, of superman we didn't call it out but that <laughs> that newspaper headline as i let everybody know in our slack chat is an ayn rand shout out in the the snyder cut of Justice. yeah and his he's talking about how his dream project is to make the fountainhead and i think that's probably why like again like there's plenty of art that i love that i don't agree with quote unquote but it's like i just can't connect to superhero movies where the core question is like, should we help all these, all these losers, <laughs> all these yeah. lo losers right. that don't deserve it? it I'm really good. Like, like, like Kevin Costner, Jonathan Kent in Man of Steel, you do see how that kind of plays in where he's like, listen, if it means revealing yourself, maybe it wasn't worth it. It's like that bus full of kids that I just saved. Are you sure dad? It's like, I mean, maybe. You make the call. And in this film, yeah, we, we'll, we'll probably get to it, but like it kind of implies that the only thing keeping Superman from snapping and, and taking over the world is is Lois Lane. Is like no, it's, one that's explicit. Ex that's not yeah. subtext, that's context. <laughs> Literally, the Flash goes through time to tell Batman that. Lois yeah. is otherwise, the key. Otherwise, he's Superman... Yeah, well, otherwise Superman thinks we are, uh, we're the bug men. We're the little pair well, team. It's just buzzing around I, for him to squash. A lot, like, I think that... We've, we've yet to have the conversation about how so much of all of these movies, the entire Snyderverse, really feels like that Zack just is fixated on the idea of bad Superman. Like, it's just, it's such a, it's such a focus for him. It, keeps, and he always it comes, comes up a back, lot. There's a lot of nightmares, but it. I mean, that right. seems to be like, uh, uh, that's the groundwork of his trilogy, quadrilogy, whatever it was going to yeah. be, well, is it's, like, it's, we're building up to Superman turning evil. Right. It seems like the, the, the tension the is always just, I need Superman to be evil, but I also need it to not break DC continuity. Like you can't just do Elseworlds. You can't just do Injustice. It has to be like, we're in the DC universe prime and also Superman is evil, which is hard to do because he's not evil. So yeah, I mean, I kind of wish they'd done like, the more. Maybe a dream sequence now or something happens or, you know.
the more explicit, uh, the, the comics version of, of the anti-life equation is literally an equation that just proves that free will is an illusion. So like once you understand the equation, you're like, well, I guess it's an illusion. I just have to follow dark side now. I wish yeah. they just shown that to Superman. And he's like, well, this all checks out. Yeah, and well, his eyes just turn red. Turn he red also, he does perfect. have super math ability. So that makes sense. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's keep going. We're, this, Powered uh, by the Earth's uh, yellow sun. We're only at part two. Let's keep going. <laughs> Black suit up for an entirely different take on the theatrical release, except for its plot, setting, main characters, and themes, where, if you recall, a gray CGI monster covered in spikes wants to destroy the world, who's out to impress his gray CGI monster boss. But this time, follow in excruciating detail as this gray CGI monster reports his progress to his gray CGI monster boss's gray CGI monster executive assistant. Decide, decide. I call to thee. I have found one man. of the three. The one that woke and called. Let me make a plea to way. him that I may come home after I take the combined the power of the two mother boxes. I've been able to finish the bring so, news before. I'm going to put this on, on Chris Terrio because I feel like this is the same thing as rise of skywalker where so much of the film is just laying pipe for like why where the little booble boxes are we got to find the key to unlock the door to get to the thing to get to the planet so much of it is like he really dwells on logistics and uh lets you know in excruciating detail how each step of the treasure hunt is going and how it's going to go and what needs to happen and i feel like people they don't trust people enough to get it by context or to just understand well these things are important they got to find it or else something bad happens it's also cooler to not show us so much like this was a real lesson of the mcu like you you sprinkle a little bit of thanos here and there you don't get we didn't really get to know him at all until infinity war it's just like oh, well, that's who Ronan's working for and there's one scene, or oh, Loki talks to him in space almost up at, behind the throne that one time. And like, that's what gives it mystique and allure and makes it cool and interesting and a tease. Whereas if you show us like 20 minutes of dark side waiting around next to an old lady like what's going on on earth and then you i mean not just that not just that one. Hit like with an the, axe yeah the first time like, you meet dark side is him getting uh, his ass really, kicked by his ass kicked even though i love david thulis yeah <laughs> I love that scene. I'll always take a, a D.H. Thulis in my movie. Um, Give me a D.H. Thulis in this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think as far as introducing your big bad goes, there there, there are other ways to do it uh, aside from having him almost die and run away. <laughs> right. And 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 to all you leaving the, but he didn't have his Omega Beams in the, in the comments, like, yes, we know. But it's like, it's the idea of... You still have uh, a choice as a writer of how you want to introduce Darkseid. Yeah, and you're just, like... It's, Here he it's, is. You want to oh, there he goes. That, He's running away. Right. You it, it, An air of mystery. We don't really want to meet him until we like meet him and it's on and he's coming to Earth and now it's the fight. We don't want to meet him and then it's like, one day maybe <laughs> next time, Gadget. Like it is a, a kind of a claw feeling to this where it's like, all right, you know, he's just going to Yeah, we don't need face. to see him like going through all of the messages that Desaad has for him. I think it, wow. it would be we better. Really... He just like notebooks like, oh, and then he found like the next mother box. Now he's looking for the other two. Like that's not necessarily the best way also to continue to have him in the movie. Maybe you really just want to wait until it's like, he's here and he's about to punch something in the face. Now, again, because this movie's four hours long, I don't feel like it was taking away from time used on action or character development. But I think if you were cutting it down, this would be the first for me to go, <laughs> is all of these um, middle just, management yeah. reports. I'm it's sorry, Mr. Side is in a meeting. Can I take a message? Yeah, yeah. it's just counterproductive. Like, it actually hurts your overall goal, which is to make Dark Side looming and scary like the big threat that how are we ever going to defeat? I also think this is where the obsession with evil Superman kind of hurts you because. In this movie, especially, like, evil Superman's a more potent threat. Like, Darkseid gets his ass kicked by Ares. Like, you, you know, he needs all of this information and plans to come together to get here. Superman at any moment could just be like, you know what? Screw you guys. And, like, that's it. We're all doomed. Like, <laughs> no one can beat Superman. So I feel like you're almost, it's, it's too much, too, mm. too much setup for stuff that, you know, like, is so way off. There you go. All right, let's keep watching. Mighty dark side came No protectors here. He no lanterns. The anti-life equation is carved into the surface of this very world. Woo! 
Meanwhile, Batman is still assembling a team of heroes to protect the Earth, where they will work together to bring back Superman and quickly prove that there's no point to a Justice League once you brought back Superman. <laughs> Honestly, they have nothing to do no. besides stand in a neat little line together. Pause. I think that that is, uh, uh, people are taking that, um, not in the spirit in which it was written, because yes, in the finale, you do need Cyborg to separate the boozle boxes and you need Flash to run uh, uh, to moonwalk backwards so fast that time goes back. But in general, they made the power gap between Superman and everyone else so explicit and so huge uh, with him kicking Wonder Woman's ass like without breaking a sweat and uh, and the nightmare sequences and the way he solos Steppenwolf like without, again, breaking a sweat, like with no problems. They've made him like it's Superman and the Justice League. Like, they've just set him up to be yeah. way too uh, uh, far above all these other supposedly, you know, mythic uh, pantheon of, of heroes. Yeah, and they make it a point to let us know um, when he comes in, and then when he he's the he can see the flash as he moves. That's definitely the point, which is like, oh yeah, well everybody's boned now. Like there's nothing you can do. Right, it, he yeah. can defeat all of them together, no sweat. It, so it's kind of like, well, then, yeah, it, it, it's it can't help but put them all in a supporting role. I would especially say you kind of highlighted some of this. Every member of the Justice League does have a role to play. Like Wonder Woman's the one who knows about who the dark side is, the, the mother boxes. She's filling in all the backstory. Cyborg's the guy who can actually get into the mother boxes and kind of speak to them. Flash has the electrical charge power. Superman's obviously just the brute force that you need. Um, Aquaman, no effort at all. But, and I like, this is the old joke. You would think just because that's the stereotype that Aquaman talked to some fish, ha ha ha. He doesn't have any role here. He likes Spears guys and he's Jason Momoa. I really feel like it stands out. Like watching this movie, you're like, they couldn't have come up with a water angle. On they the did, they, they found out that there was like one moment where uh, that facility started flooding and Aquaman was like, oh, oh, oh yeah, here's oh, my chance. Finally, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and, and even then, like he kind of holds it off. Like he's he, like, he doesn't like save the day, like gives him a few extra seconds to escape. I don't know. Well, the I funny felt... thing is, like, uh, kind of hand in hand with Superman being so far and above everyone, Batman is so far and above <laughs> below everyone as far as power set that right. nobody <laughs> is is in any danger from uh, a, an onrushing wave of water except for Batman. Right. I think Wonder Woman, uh, uh, but, Cyborg. I mean, Cyborg. But he's got well, a he can role. Fly. He's the project <laughs> he manager. Get There's so like. Get Batman's your your you know your EP like there is no Justice League without Batman he brought it all together so like if he, he's got a role to play in this story like yeah but I think it's Bruce it's pure Wayne vanity on Batman's part that he's not like an Oracle or an Alfred oh his yes. ego can't he should absolutely be that. like at the computer like all right you guys should go and yes he's like they have to spend half their time just like saving him or bringing him along. And but, setting um, up like, okay, we need we need a couple scenes explaining why he has some new gauntlets that could uh, keep him alive for a fraction of a second longer. Just in case. that that <laughs> scene with Jeremy Irons and and Gal Gadot, where he's showing her his gauntlets and then how to make tea, is like first of all, she's like thousands of years old and from Greece. She knows how to make tea. I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, but Ridiculous. even when Batman's been working in Europe, yeah. The yeah, idea even... that an old British guy knows how to make tea <laughs> better than a Mediterranean goddess is like, excuse you. But um but also that's what is that? So like even in a director's cut, what is that scene doing there? I feel like halfway through the scene, it feels like Alfred's gonna break the fourth wall and be like, You don't need to see this. Back to Master Wayne. Like, what? come on. I think you had to show that like Bruce was trying to get on their level by making weapons that look right. and feel like hers, but that's it's, also right. that's a five second conversation. It's to set up when Superman goes evil and Batman holds the gauntlet up. I guess he thought we'd be like, Ain't no way Batman's gauntlets can hold off. Yeah, so instantly like, vaporized. Oh, if I show that that Alfred made them special, then yeah. no internet complaints. Yeah. That was for us. <laughs> All right, keep going. <laughs> Good job, team. Okay, Soups, take it from here.
with two and a half Casablancas worth of runtime to fill. Everyone's getting more character depth, like Aquaman, who doesn't want to live under the sea, but doesn't want to be where the people are either, because the surface world is full of horny Bjorks. The Flash, who's ditched the awkward jokes. Dostoevsky. For awkwardly touching his wiener next to Iris West. Batman, who has so little to offer the team, they give him and Alfred a little airplane to work on as a treat. Best minds away in aerospace couldn't make it fly. Oh, Christ. Wonder Woman, a goddess haunted by her own relentless theme music. No. And Cyborg, know how to make where the change from Joss Whedon to Zack Snyder <laughs> is most apparent. Booyah. F*** the world. Watch <laughs> Ray Fisher shine as the emotional heart of the story Pause. and the air. I, I have to bring up, in the fake, like, Easter, or April Fool's Snyder cut, fake out, honest trailer we did last year, one of the things that we sort of predicted was we replaced a bunch of the, like, funny catchphrase lines with dark versions. Like I believe it was uh, Momoa saying like, my man, and we replaced it with, I'm sad. I'm sad. <laughs> and uh, we then actually got to do that joke for real. Like, like Cyborg replaced <laughs> his booyah with fuck the world. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Cyborg stuff. I mean, look, yes, he was the emotional core of the film, even though it doesn't start until about an hour and 20 <laughs> into yeah. the film when you when it really gets going um and i think that there was i don't know just a bit of a logic bump for me of like his life has been saved by his father he saved his he thought he was dead and he finds out that actually no he's alive in a robot body and he's instantly pissed I think that you could have had like a growing realization that, okay, maybe this is actually, I'm a monster. Maybe this is more than I bargained for, but I think that it, it could have been more powerful. I think if there, if it started off with the, the joy and it like turns into horror rather than I'm alive and I fucking hate it. <laughs> this, <sucks. laughs> this instantly sucks. Like, come on, you get to fly now. You, you thought you were dead and you can now control the stock market. Like there's gotta I, be some kind yeah. of fun in there. Yeah. Take it, take it, at least take a test drive or something like have some fun. If it does feel like when the kid is like gifted the wrong car and like gets kind of mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dad, yeah. I want well, a Prius. It's, it's also weird that he's already like, he's a, before any of this happens, he is a like the most popular kid at school, football hero, and apparently like a brilliant, computer hacker who was like and like a really good guy like he was doing his hacking on behalf of a fellow student who you know was going through grief and like had this loss and like he's compassionate and it's just like it's 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 more interesting to give a lot of power to someone who was not at all power you know like the peter parker mm. of it like it's such a power fantasy already to be Vic Stone and then to become Cyborg. I just feel like it's like hat on a hat already. Like, oh man, if you're Vic Stone, starting quarterback for a D1 college program, right. I mean, you are you are balling out so hard. Like your life is not about you know. Oh, I got to study for my test, or else my dad's gonna be mad at me. Like yeah, he's like it, he's like Tim Tebow times a million. Yeah, it just it just seems like I don't know. You don't give yourself like a lot of places to go when he's already like a god even when he's just like a, a mortal guy you know and like i think that's kind of a it's a little bit of a snyderian thing like a person can't just be like good at something they have to be like the best like everything's got to be like like you know eight eight adjectives for how badass and awesome and cool and perfect and amazing it is and it's just like well that doesn't give you a lot of places to go when you're developing a character yeah, uh, though, I mean, they uh, the quibbles aside, I think that they um, Ray Fisher did a great job. Certainly, sir, he's certainly in this movie, uh, which you, which is more than you can say about the last one. And like, I think a necessary presence, because like you said, everyone is at such a far remove. They're basically like carved into stone and ha ha pun. And he is, um, uh, you know, he actually they make attempts at humanizing him, him in the flash, but I think a lot more successfully with uh, with Cyborg. Um, I don't, is... I don't really think any of our criticisms are aimed at the the performances. Like I, I think these are, I, I, I think it's always the the writing and the what they're doing what they can with these slivers of character they're they're being given. I, yeah, Especially, I think all the performances. Like, 
Yeah, like <laughs> Affleck, Ray Fisher, uh, Momoa, like they're not being given a ton and they are doing what they can. Like, I don't, none of, none of these criticisms I think are aimed at any of these actors. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to single out Gal Gadot, but um, I feel like uh, she's kind of, I mean, and it, I guess it makes sense for a 5,000 year old who's seen it all, but she kind of is unchanging see on a scene to scene whether it's making tea with alfred or the return of superman it's just always like you know it's just kind of played the same she she flourishes with a director who knows how to how to use her like she like she's been much better than this in other movies that that's what i'll say (laughs) all right let's keep going to batman's mantle of depression who's lost his body lost his parents and might be the only college football star to risk losing his place on the team for academic violations. That doesn't mean he can hack into our system to change his friend's grades. You know this dude plays for Gotham U and they just beat a Big Ten program like Wisconsin? Not only does he get a pass for hacking grades, there's a 90% chance Bruce Wayne just bought him an Escalade. Yeah, the honest version of that scene is that Dean's like, how can we keep this secret? Prepare your ears <laughs> for Snyder's trademark brand of muscular visual filmmaking. Packed to that, the brim with hogs no allergic sense. to their He's, own shirts. How could he flex the spikes? I don't get it. Here. Boo! Boo that woman! Where every action scene got immeasurably better thanks to new additions like Amazon horse violence, Atlantean Aww. bloodbending, the gods of Olympus reminding Darkseid who's the daddy, extreme sesame seed close ups, and heroes who take time to inspire the next generation before their victims' brains have even finished dripping down the walls. Can I be like you someday? You can be anything you want to be. But man, at the risk of being- Smell like corpses in that room. So, like, oh my you God. just watched like 10 dudes get brutally murdered. Can and I and be that's like before- you someday? No, you can't. <laughs> this is right after somebody, oh, that's a good point, Danielle. No, you cannot. Um, you're not a I god. Have, no. yeah, I'm you're not a god. Zeus's daughter. I don't care how many <laughs> times you do, you scale the aggro crag, you're never gonna get up to being Zeus's <laughs> yeah. kid. It's just a sense of timing that I think is just sometimes missing a little bit. Uh, I guess there's like nowhere else to put beats like this, but it reminds me of when Superman was making out with Lois in the in the smoking crater at the center of Metropolis. Um, it, it's just there's a time and a place, Zach and Chris and or David Goyer, whoever wrote that last one. Mm-hmm. There's a time and a place, and just the emotional through line of like these kids are screaming for their life as a terrorist unloads on them with a full auto gun, and she's like. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. <laughs> they would all still be screaming if not catatonic and she's like i want to be just like you yeah it's it's and i read i read a deborah and zack Snyder did an interview where they they were asked about that scene where wonder woman like throws dudes into walls head first and there's like blood smear and they were like well you got to show the consequence like it's wrong to show violence without consequences it's like that then it's glamorizing the violence I'm like i get that i do whoa I, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna stop you slash them right there it's glamorizing it when you do it in slow mo and like well, treat right. it like you're well, watching like a living fresco of like that's, oh this that's is that's what so I was about to say. <laughs> but you could also set up the scene in a way that she just like ties all those guys up or like manages to take them out without killing them all. Which I also feel like character wise is what Wonder Woman would do, especially in front of a room full of children. Like that's part of the character is that you're not just gonna like brutally murder all of these dudes and i know that the response is always like well but she they, she has to or they're gonna blow up the city it's like but all these scenarios are like that's what he's writing like that's what they're coming they're coming up with a scenario that requires wonder woman to like kill 10 guys yeah not not that it has to tie in but you saw post uh, or wonder woman 1984 i think it opened with like a, a child endangerment scenario and right. she la- <laughs> not that this should have happened in the snyder cut though it would have been hilarious if like a guy's like spinning around in like a mall display like whoop, 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 exactly whoop, whoop. you can obviously make this kind of that. action whatever you want and it's a yeah. choice to make it this brutal and uh in front like and, and to make it brutal like batman kill it like oh, okay it doesn't bother me that much but in front of a room full of children it's, it's a it's a weird vibe that whole scene is just very odd that it's so i crazy. think the nine well we'll see in wonder woman 94 what what changed you know maybe she got really into uh nine inch nails it's just gonna be the same but she's, she's gonna going have through. a flannel around her waist she just watches living single all day <laughs> all right keep going 
eating a dead Superman. This guy loves his slow motion. I mean, come on. The Flash's super speed gets the same treatment as Lois Lane putting down a cup of coffee. Is her drink going back in time, or is she just extra sad about her husband? There's a big <sighs> So gather round the for the <laughs> epic culmination of a mass movement built around the sincere belief that it wasn't enough for Zack Snyder to do whatever he wanted for two box office disappointments. It's not enough that grim superhero storytelling is basically its own genre now. No, this film had to exist in its purest form. Or rather, this film always existed in its purest form, and the $70 million Warner spent on it was for, uh, snacks or something. But now that it's finally here, Snyder's biggest fans can finally lay down their arms and be satisfied that their hero's journey got a proper ending. Oh, come on! <laughs> so wait, as you but pass by pause. C. Uh, you know... Not that I will join in or or support, you know, bombing everybody's Twitter feed, but why wouldn't they do it again? Why wouldn't they keep going? It worked. Yeah, I mean, this is why you don't negotiate with terrorists, because then they, <laughs> then you're just like, a, you're saying, well, terrorism works. Like, do do a terrorism on us and we'll we'll cave, you know? Like, that's, that's what happened. Yeah, now, get ready Lana, for skywriting in your Obviously, area. this is not on the same level as actual terrorism, uh, uh, but... but of course, Snyder fans have that appreciation for nuance that we're that we're using here. I'm, I'm not, just saying, I'm not that why... saying that this is the same <laughs> as terrorism. I'm saying the tactic is the same. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I can. I, I, I'm trying to think of other situations where this is like. I mean, yeah, people. There's like hashtags that get things to manifest in the real world all the time. Yeah, we've been nerds. Yeah, got, sure. We have been doing this forever. I remember when it was like brown coats get together and and do stuff. There was one show I wish I could remember off the top of my head where they were like mail a penny, mail a penny to their offices and like say that this is what you want and we'll get it. So this sure. is like oh, it's yeah, just that... the first time something this notable has worked because usually it just like they might get another season if it's a TV show just because they're showing interest, but usually this doesn't work. So. Yeah, yeah. I, don't and I think, think that like people who are diehard for... Marvel, Go ahead. I gotta say, diehard Marvel fans will will never do this because I feel like they've been trained to just be happy with whatever comes out. <laughs> like, yay! Yeah, like there's nothing that they that they would demand. I can't think of like a, a, a well, or, well, Star I don't know. I'm trying to think. Star Wars fans definitely have a. There's some hashtags to be but to that, be created on the Star say. Wars side of things. So much of this does seem to come down to, in some ways, a cult of personality, like more so than an idea or a pitch for what the universe should be, or like that kind of a notion. It's the idea of rallying behind a creator that seems to get a lot of this going. Like, like it yeah. was the Zack Snyder ness of it that I think rallied this community so strongly. And the fact that he was there on Vero, like encouraging people and posting things and teasing and Momoa was joining in and Ray Fisher, obviously. Like, I think that was a big part of it. And so uh, I think you, you do see that in Star Wars that it tends to be either beloved or divisive controversial figures that tend to become lightning rods for this. And I think you would see it with Marvel too. It would just have to be Kevin Feige. Like, yeah, and I think that guy. this could only, like you said, this could only work for um, something on the WB side, because I think that like, as a filmmaker, you've already compromised by uh, making a Disney film. <laughs> I just think that, I don't mean that like in a <laughs> insulting way. I just think that there are, uh, there are certain considerations you have to make for franchises as a whole and things yeah. you can and can't do and the ways you can and can't play with these characters that like, if you've signed on to make a Marvel movie, you've i guess it's like edgar wright would be the last time somebody tried to do their own thing and and paid the price but in this day and age it's like you know the, the, here's the tools you have to work with and like you're either going to play ball or not like i just yeah, think I mean, that if you're chloe Zhao, you can you can do nomad land or you could do eternals and there's like obviously it's a very different scenario in terms of how much of your own creative control you have over what you're doing yeah um so just, yeah, yeah i facts. think that's just facts people um so i think it is uh it's cool that this happened for uh, a filmmaker even if it's one that doesn't uh, resonate with me i am in favor of filmmakers getting to do their own thing and actually put their vision up on sure. screen and, and um, like i don't sure. think any of us have an issue with 
filmmakers getting to do their definitive versions of their movies or getting to see new versions or cuts of things that we like or even passionate fan campaigns. I think what's so much of the reaction to this group and this movement in particular was how negative and toxic and aggressive it became. Well, it's just- it's it's not everybody, that's not the whole group. The humor of it is, to me at least, is that it's the same level of seriousness with which Zack Snyder treats these characters. And if you don't share that seriousness, if in your mind, Batman and Superman are of the same level of respect in your life as Bazooka Joe or Archie, it just strikes you as a little bit silly that this this is such a passionate and such like a grim, serious cause. Uh, uh, So taking a step back, that's where I find it. Uh, that's where I find the fun in it. Um, sure. But enough about that. Let's move on. Because we still got like seven parts left. Oh, they were clearly setting up multiple sequels, teasing fans with the ultimate fantasy of watching Darkseid and Superman take the rest of Earth to Pound Town, ensuring that every tweet, article, or public statement about Warner Brothers will get swarmed with a hashtag Restore the Snyderverse, something that will never, ever happen. Until DC's annual firing of the executives and the next ones make it happen. Bullying remains undefeated, y'all. Wait, it's still not over? That was a natural place to stop. <sighs> Welcome entirely new additions like Martian Manhunter, whose appearance raises questions like, where the f*** has Martian Manhunter been? And how often has he hit the town disguised as Diane Lane? And Jared Leto's Joker finally sharing a scene with Ben Affleck's Batman. I mean, they clearly didn't film together, but you can imagine what it would be like if they finally shared a scene. Who's gonna give you a reach around? <sighs> it would suck. Okay, this thing is way too long, and I've been holding in pee since part four. Can you just roll every time they say mother box? I'll be right back. <gasps> mother boxes. 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 Oh, that's better. All right, time for starring. Daddy Warbats. I'm rich. Wonder Woman, restorer of ancient art and antiquities. Never mind. It's not a phase, Mom. This is who I am now. Every high steam needs an IT guy. Debbie Drowner. I want to be left alone. This is a bad idea. His father's dead because of us. <laughs> Quipsilver. Mr. T. Put the water in first, so we don't scald the tea. Uh, that's probably enough tea. And then leave it to mash. Big City Elegy. Pause. Pause. Infuriated that you didn't go with tea prepared there. That's such, such a good joke for that beat. Tea I don't get prepared. It. What is this? What is this reference? <laughs> Jeremy Irons uh, played Scar in the original um, Lion King, and that's the song is Be Prepared that he sings. Uh, oh, I always, you know, I, <laughs> I always tune out during the villain songs. You know that. <laughs> Those <laughs> are the, the most skippable songs. You don't know Be Prepared? <laughs> I know Be Lion Prepared. King? Not line for line, Lon. I've heard the song. <laughs> it's the chorus. <laughs> I even wrote in the notes, I even wrote, a la the Lion King, and then T pre, and then all caps, pair. Tea prepared. It got 150 likes on Twitter in like two hours. <laughs> well, everyone give uh, uh, send, Lon, send Lon his roses and um, oh boy, and, and, and then just Mr. Imagine... T, and then we just go with Mr. T. It's like even a T joke. Shock. I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Oh you know, I, I don't. I should have fought. It. You're right. I should have fought harder. Yeah, there's there's only a, a thousand pages to to juggle I through know, on this I one. You kind of flag it like. And I know. Listen, here. sometimes I write song starrings, and then we don't do them just because it's a little, you know. It's, it's also hard yes, to John John Bailey, extremely talented voice actor, can do any voice in the one world. One of the top voice men in the business. It's a lot I to ask know. to also sing right. as well. Um, I don't so. like to give him too many musical things to do, but in this <laughs> case, I thought it was. Yeah. All right. All right. Guys. Keep going. The T minus 10 minutes. Elegy. The Put this mic back on. Put this mic back on. Is this movie rushing or dragging? It's dragging. Maybe this guy should stop working with robots. The boar is lava. I'm made of rocks, as you can see. I don't let that intimidate you. Martha Manhunter. <laughs> the living joke. 
Mira's accent? The firstborn of beloved Queen Atlanta. You are the firstborn son of Queen Atlanta. And your mama's box is so smelly, Steppenwolf can track it halfway across the globe. You have been near a mother box. The scent is on you. Oh! Justice League, bigger, longer, and uncut. Working on an ID sketch? <laughs> Where did they find that sketch artist? The leprechaun guy? <laughs> I think we all cracked up when they when they threw that one up on the screen during the watch along. <laughs> it's weird because it's like, well, wouldn't know a professional sketch artist have been drawing it? So should it look a little bit better? Like if I had like the big the hazmat gloves on or something. But, yeah. Well, they're wearing goggles like that. You would think if nothing else, you would get the circular eyes and the teeth. It, it it had to be bad enough that it could be Batman or a or a Bugman. Yeah, so, I, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, but still, that was that was pretty silly. Um, God, so I guess that there's things that we cut. I believe <laughs> that was one of the longest ones we've done in a while. But let's see what didn't make it in. He's so OP. Snyder will take any excuse to turn Soup's evil. You know, somewhere in the multiverse, Zack just adapts the Injustice games and makes everyone happy. Anyone else? Starring The Dark Knight Advises. Imagine all the heroes fighting in a league. Clark after dark. The Corpse Husband. The Fantastic Mr. Box. Wet and pushy. Hey, that's littering. Arrest him, Batman. Adobe Flash. Time Bandit. Irons Man, Amy Saddams, Prickly Pete, all horned up for Mother's Box. Batman, give me a picture of Spider-Man. Okay, hold for Dark Side. One moment, please. Shamos, a hero that would have been useful yesterday. The green screen of crime. The do-over. And there you have it. Um, yeah, not much. Not much was left on the cutting room play. I think that the idea was to just throw everything at the wall, a la the Snyder yeah. Cut. You know, with the parts, the chapter headings. Uh, if it's too long, you know, you pause after chapter three, and then and then come back and finish it's it. Treat it like a mini series. Come back to it. <laughs> It'll be there waiting. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, I believe it's that time to to wade into uh, the comment section. So oh boy. let's. See. <laughs> Let's see what hashtag uh, restore the spy the Snyderverse. We know. <laughs> Gosh, where to begin? Um, let's see. Uh, was that, uh, so this isn't in there, but was that John doing the Taika Waititi? Right, like that's not oh, Taika yeah. Waititi audio. I wanted to confirm that. Yeah, you did a great job. Yeah. Um, yeah, he really did. He really nailed the Korg voice. Okay. That's why I don't like. I we try to play to his strengths. I don't want. I don't try to make the man sing unless I have to. Yeah. James Zuniga writes: uh, Should the lesson of the movie be number one, finishing remaking or retconning a movie won't make it better, or two, it totally works now and remake episode eight and episode nine of Star Wars? Well, I think those are two different situations, right? Um, I feel like. Uh, Ryan Johnson did make his his version of Star Wars. So who's retcon? Who's remaking it? Like this is a kind of a unique thing where a, a film was taken from its director. And I mean, you could remake Episode Nine with Ryan Johnson. I'm sure that would make everyone happy. <laughs> I will say, I think that in general, people are too precious about remakes. Like every time a new remake is announced, it's always like, oh, why? Like I even saw this today. They announced Spiral, the new like reboot of the Saw franchise. Saw, yeah. And people were just like, let it die. And it's like, Saw, it's not that great to begin with. You don't need to let it die for its own sake. Like, let's try it again. Who knows? Maybe maybe we'll figure out a better way to, a better take on it. Like, so I'm, I'm just generally like, I'm not ever bothered or offended by the idea of remake. So if we wanted to just start like, remake movies that were from not that long ago and let another director have their spin on it like i'm i'm honestly fine with that like i think that would be fun like why not let it let three more directors give us another take on star wars sequels like i'd, I'd go see them hmm. i think um just for the first question in this is should the lesson of this movie be uh you know finishing remaking or retconning a movie won't make it better in this case it did make it better i mean it's the it did make it a better movie. So I don't know if that's the lesson we necessarily come away with um, because this is leagues better than um, the first Justice League was. It just is. 
But yeah, it's not. It's the. It's it's not a. It's not a like reconsideration or remake. Like it, it's like they gave the movie to somebody else and he mucked it up. And this is more like a rest. A little bit more like a restoration. So it, at, at to Spencer's point, it's sort of somewhere in the middle. I don't know if you could base a future principle off of what happened here because that's such a weird situation. Yeah, but you're right. It's obviously like a ton, like I would much rather watch this one than the 2017 one. Uh, Arthur Mingo writes, uh, I have a question. Why does Chris Terrio not get blame and only Zack Snyder? And I Ooh. wholeheartedly agree, Arthur. Um, I, I because I, this question. I do think that Zack Snyder is a incredible visual filmmaker. He knows how to frame these heroes and make it look epic and awe-inspiring and like what it would really look like if Superman was fighting Zod through Metropolis. Like that's, he can really uh, put that on screen in front of you. And I think my main issue with these films is is usually the dialogue. It's usually the 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 plotting, and it's like, you know, of course, it's a, like I said, it's annoying when Marvel goes too far into the quippy, like, oh, that just happened uh, of it all. But it's also really boring when some of these DC movies go too far into like, now we must as we must form a league and now you to my side and i will become the king of the world no you will become well i will stop you and it's just like it's the dialogue is just surface it's just telling you what they're thinking and what they're going to do to you and if this happens then that's going to happen it's just not compelling writing to me and i i place that mostly at the blame of uh, of the of the screenwriter not the director uh, this is normally the spot where I would be like, look, these kind, like, this is as much an organizational project as it is a creative project, like a movie like this. And so I sympathize with a person who's brought in to be like, make sense of this whole shared universe and bring all these disparate stories and characters together. But I'm not going to say that in this case because Chris Terrio also co-wrote Dawn of Justice and he's inheriting all of the problems that he set up for himself in the previous movie. So he gets no sympathy for me at all. It's like, you got, you got multiple movies. He just inherited Man of Steel and we got this like crazy chaotic mess of a thing. And it's like, this, this story doesn't need to be this convoluted. Like if you're gonna spend four hours telling this story, the focus should be on these characters and making us care about these relationships, not on explaining mother boxes to us 18 times. There, it's, there are three boxes and you gotta keep them apart. That's it, it's very simple. <laughs> it's more than one scene. That's all it is. Don't let the boxes touch her. It's the end of the world. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay, I get it. Um... All right. Okay, Wendigo. Do I need to hook you... into them, and do we need to like? No, just keep them apart. Keep them apart. Just Wendigo twenty sixty four or five writes. My biggest question for the film: Were those the most expensive fake hot dogs of all time? And I would say no, because well, I wonder if that scene's budget equaled the entire budget of Sausage Party. Someone will have to figure that out. <laughs> oh. Was that, I think that was, might technically- Seth Rogen really should have voiced that hot dog that Barry puts in his pocket. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> oh, so I want to hear Seth Rogen's laugh in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> I think that- <laughs> I think I was doing Fat Albert's laugh. Uh. All right, and Pedro Benitez writes, I don't think I heard anything positive towards the movie in the trailer. Well, I, I disagree. I can pick out some favorites, some positive lots lines. Lots of stuff. But, I think we, we definitely uh, point out how much better it is than the Whedon version. Uh, yes, and then um, let's see. He says, uh, what was each one of your favorite parts? Um, I liked all the Amazon stuff. I thought the Amazon stuff was great, especially like extended and when we do get horse fighting. Um, yeah, that was easily my favorite part was everything with the Amazons that we got to see now. I agree. The stuff that's added inside the, where it's like Steppenwolf shows up and then they're sealing the yep. vault and Hippolyta has to like scooch out. Like that, that's much better in, in the new version. I uh, I will say it was it was both extremely crazy, but so specific to Zack Snyder. Uh, that I that I loved it would be the midwinter uh, Norwegian Aquaman farewell ceremony scene. Like it's so weird and out of nowhere. And it once you start thinking about it, you're like, wait, he's the first Aquaman, and he's like 40 years old or a little younger. So they just started doing this a few years ago. Like this is not an ancient village rite that these guys do every year when Aquaman comes. 
This is like a spontaneous thing that happened. <laughs> no, he he has them all rehearse. Uh, he's been working. Hey, I'm gonna a take off, but when I go, do you guys mind singing a little song about me while I go? And like, oh, you can smell my shirt if you wanna. Sopranos, yeah. you're a little pitchy. <laughs> and I will I will echo and and call out uh, a, a very clear co uh, a compliment in the script where every action scene got immeasurably better. And I fully agree with that. I, I can't pick a favorite because they all got more sensible and cooler looking. And that should be the core of a Justice League film. If you're going to make it, you want to see all the Justice League in action. And man, he nailed it. Like mm -hmm. every time Steppenwolf raided a different you know, building or temple or whatever, it became like this incredible back and forth and just this amazing action sequence. Um, the Flash one, little odd choice with the wieners, um, but but otherwise. That seems really uh, weird too, because it's a funny scene. Like he's he's trying to get this yeah. job at the pet store and it's amusing. And then he's going to go save her and it becomes really, like he plays this really somber needle drop and it becomes this really sad scene while he saves Iris. And then it's immediately back to being funny again, where he's there's, giving the dog There's the too hot much dog. time between p plucking the wiener and paying off the wiener joke. Wow, there's, yeah. there's like there's five too much time between too the much two of those. Time. Yeah. And I will quickly yeah. just, uh, I took the song to be, it almost felt like in Romeo and Juliet when they're meeting each other through the glass. That was kind of what I felt the song was evoking for me. I don't know if that was on purpose. Right, I, I, yes, it, you're, you are correct. In the context of that scene, he's seeing, uh, this is gonna become, uh, this is Iris, you know, it's like his love for the franchise. But I don't, I don't feel like they sell that in the movie, and it just feels like the pacing is off, and it's weird. But yes, you, I'm sure conceptually it was. Well, he's falling in love with this woman who will become his love interest in the in the subsequent film that we're still waiting on, maybe one day. But yeah, he is a just to reiterate, he's a titanically talented visual filmmaker and director of of huge superhero action scenes. I think that yeah, the, I prefer the, it to really any third act Marvel movie where it's just kind of these globs of armies smashing into each other. I think I it's- I would go it's that far. But I, I would say the, the, other, the other moment that now stands out to me is when the Flash is like running backwards through time and everything is like filling in around him. That's a really yeah. good one. Yeah, so there you go. I think, uh, look, I think if you're looking, us, looking for us to be super positive about any comic book movie, uh, you, it's going to be tough to find. It's going to be tough to find something that we have no notes on, but that's part of the fun. Uh, I hope it's uh, received in the same good nature in which it was intended. I'm sure it will be. Um, but that's our- Spider-Verse, we all loved into the Spider-Verse. We did all of Spider-Verse, and, and if you have anything bad to say about Japanese Spider-Man, I will fight you. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get the hell out. Yeah, I am the defender of Planet Spider. Yeah. Um, so we, we've got another epic uh, clash next week for honest trailers to tease for you guys. Um, it's on the level of Batman versus Superman. So it's something equally powerful uh, coming at you next week. And wow, I think we're just over an hour, which means I have to go. Juan, Danielle, thank you for <laughs> hanging out with me. People, thank you for watching. Please like, please subscribe if you've hung around this long. And uh, we'll talk about the Snyder Cut again, I'm sure. I'm sure. You better this believe won't it. Be the, Tomorrow, this SJU, won't be, the be last. ready. <laughs> <laughs> but keep the conversation going, and uh, and we'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching.